What's up, everyone? This is the World's Mayor Experience, Episode 3. Eventually, I'm going to run out of fingers, and I don't know how I'm going to do that. Am I going to just do hand signals? And Anyway, it doesn't matter. I want to welcome you here if you're watching on YouTube, Rumble, uh, directly on theworldsmayor.com or joshuatberglin.com or listening on any of your favorite podcast networks. Thank you so much for being here. Today is going to be a very interesting broadcast. We're going to discuss plastic pollution, and we're also going to discuss blood batteries. Now, instead of just, I mean, when you, I, I don't know about you, but when you hear the words plastic pollution, I have certain images that come to mind. What are yours? Like, what is it that you think of when you think of plastic pollution? Some people don't take it serious. Some do. Some people get really dramatic about it. <laughs> and there's a lot of different opinions. And then sometimes there is no opinion at all because somebody doesn't care. All of those are possible. Today, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm not going to tell you how to think or even what to believe. I'm going to present information to you that you may find interesting. I know I find it interesting. In fact, this the, what I've learned about plastic pollution has dramatically changed my behavior about plastic. That said, I still use plastic. I'm not a freaking weirdo. At the same time, which you probably don't know, I've reused this bottle about 15 times because it's still good. And there's really nothing wrong with it. And they keep washing it and all of that. So anyway, I'm really, uh, I'm excited actually to deliver this information because I remember when I first learned about it, and again, there's some stuff that I'm going to learn new today. Uh, but when I first learned about this, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. And having lived in California and been blessed to live in Hawaii and other beach cities, South Florida, you know, I look, the beaches, beaches are awesome. I'm not really big on the sand <laughs> for some reason. I don't like the sand unless if it's like Lanikai um, or some Caribbean white sand that feels like baby powder. But that's another story. Um, but I don't really like the sand that much, but I love to look at the beach and I love the water. Don't necessarily want to get in the water, but I like to look at it. I like to be on it. Um, and a lot of that has to do with plastic pollution. And, but that's a, that's a whole other story, but I don't want that to scare you off or make you run away because again, this information is interesting. Because it affects us all. It, whether you live in a beach city or not, I don't live in a beach city anymore. I live in Minnesota and I live by a bunch of lakes and a really awesome river here in Northfield, Minnesota. But, you know, we have a bunch of lakes here. And of course, th that pollution bothers me too because it's ugly. I mean, we have these this beautiful planet. And again, I'm not a, a weirdo about this kind of stuff, but you know, I believe in being a good steward, a good steward of our environment. If I see litter, I want to pick it up. I do pick it up most of the time because sometimes people litter some really vile crap and I don't want to touch it. But, you know, I do my part in picking things up because I care. I love, I live in a beautiful place and I don't want it to look trashy. And of course, most people in my community actually take care of everything. But that's not always the case in a lot of cities and towns. Mine is different. That said, um, before I even moved to Northfield, I've I've had this passion because I've lived in a bunch of beach cities, been very fortunate to do that. And I care. I care about the animals that I see in the ocean. I care about my kids uh, who want to go play in the water and on those beaches. I don't want to see heroin needles or, I mean, used needles, which could be a heroin needle, um, uh, plastic cups, condoms, bras, and like all the other weird stuff that people just leave behind. And, um, but this is, this plastic pollution problem goes much, much deeper than you think. The other thing we're going to discuss today uh, that I think is going to be interesting for you there's a lot of people that, you know, are all about big oil and 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 natural gas and 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 then they and they're they're all for it. And you know, they they want gas and they want the big engines and that all that. And 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 you know what? I get it. I grew up in that culture and I grew up wanting to have the big truck and and the powerful cars and all that other stuff. And and to to be honest with you, still 
have no issue with it. Um, but I also fully recognize why people would want to go electric and, and, and they're all about green energy. Cause I, I get, I hear the talking points. Um, I don't necessarily, I'm not really drawn to electric vehicles because unless if it's a Tesla or, you know, one of the really, really higher end versions of, of an electric vehicle, they're just not attractive vehicles. Now, some people care about that. Some people don't. Me personally, I'd rather not drive. I walk as much as possible. Um, I'm not a fan of driving. I'd rather be driven. And I like, you know, taking Uber and I like being driven around. That's just that's just me because I'm a bad driver. So I don't really have judgment towards anyone with their choices when it comes to what they choose to drive. I don't. Um, I totally get why people are all about electric cars or hybrids. And I totally get why people may be about, you know, gas and super premium and all that stuff, too, because I've heard the talking points from both sides and, the, and both sides make very compelling arguments. In fact, both arguments for green or against green because they're pro gas or pro oil. Well, you know, there I, I've heard those talking points can make a lot of sense because like a lot of arguments that are made. You can argue it a certain way to make it sound very appealing. It's like why statistics, statistics can be misleading. Um, I, I know like even studies, studies can be misleading. I've learned that uh, from creating products, creating skincare lines and and, and medical devices. I, I, you know, I know how a lot of that works. I mean, some things are on the up and up and sometimes it's a little sketchy. And yeah, even the double blind placebo controlled uh, uh, testing can be flawed. Yeah, it's true. I'm not saying it always is, but it can be. So again, back to this, this, the statement, I'm not here to tell you what to believe. Um, but when it comes to electric vehicles, there is another side of the story that does not get spoken about enough. And what is that? Have you heard of Blood Diamonds? You know, there's a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and it talked about, you know, the diamond trade and how you know, it talk, got into deep about Blood Diamonds um, and how that works. And, and, and for some people, it, it, it really turned them off. For some people, it inspired them to fight and make change. Other people didn't give a crap. Well, there's something called blood batteries that I think people should know about. Now, again, this is up to you to make a judgment call whether or not you want to support electric vehicles or not. Uh, maybe it's not even that you're going to fight against electric vehicles, but you're going to find a different solution. I don't know. I, that's not for me to say. It's up to you to decide what's best for you, your own life, and your family. I'm not here to do that, but I am going to present some information today Um that I think is going to be pretty interesting. Some of it are I've created some talking points to discuss, but also I'm going to show you a couple clips from WION News, um, which is a random news station that I found about a year ago on YouTube because I was looking for alternative news sources. And, you know, I I really kind of like them. I don't know if they what their regular agenda is because I try not to watch the news at all. In fact, I'd rather just look out my window or go outside and let the news come to me <laughs> how it comes to me. Um, and it's not about, you know, not wanting to be informed. It's just that I don't really trust the way I'm being informed. I don't trust that that information is accurate most of the time. So I've done a lot of research. I'm not an expert on any of these subjects at all. Um, what I'm hoping to do is encourage debate. In a conversation and i would love to have real experts on um whether it's this amazing host i, I love this woman and i can't i can't remember her or pronounce her name from wion news uh, but also from plastic oceans which is a there's a youtube channel it's a nonprofit organization uh, i'm going to play one of their videos too so uh, this again, I think this is just going to be interesting for you and maybe give you a different perspective because, you know, having a different there's nothing wrong with having a different perspective. It may not necessarily be a perspective you agree with, but having a different viewpoint on something 
uh, is always healthy because it either will confirm your current beliefs or make you realize that maybe your beliefs are not really based in truth. I've been going through a lot of that lately. Um, so much, so, so many different things. And ah, it's humbling. It's humbling to realize that I don't know near as much as I thought I did originally. And, and I'm pretty smart and I do a lot of research and, but even that you can find out later that it's flawed. I don't believe that this information is flawed because I've seen it. I've, I've, I've spoken to people that actually have lived those lives. Um, I did a, I was blessed to be a part of a documentary uh, about brick kiln slavery uh, in Pakistan. And, and that happens in India and other countries too. But through that and met some other people that were knew about organ harvesting and knew about um, the blood batteries and got to hear and see things that just blew my mind. So I'm not going to share anything that's going to get me <laughs> demonetized and kicked off the podcast networks and YouTube and Rumble. I'm not going to do anything like that. Um, but these clips that I'm going to play are informative. They're truthful, the factual, not opinion based, and I believe it's really insightful. So, without further ado, welcome to the World's Mayor Experience, Episode Three. I'm your host, Joshua T. Berglund, also known as the World's Mayor, and I'm grateful that you're here today. If you don't mind, please like, subscribe, and share this with friends. If you enjoy this content, I don't want you to give me a sympathy like or comment. Uh, I really do love authenticity. So if you think I suck, tell me I suck. Because here's the thing. If you tell me I suck, kind of helps me anyway. So speak freely. <laughs> anyway, So the reason why this show is called The World's Mayor Experience is because it's not really meant to be just a regular podcast or live stream or broadcast. No, we have a mission behind The World's Mayor Experience. Uh, what we hope to do without giving you the full vision we are all about teaching media literacy, and we've developed multiple programs and multiple courses. I invented Media Company in a Box, which you will see a very six-second commercial about at some point in this broadcast. And um, I'm very passionate about teaching media literacy to the youth, uh, to people that are former trafficking victims, even, I mean, I guess I would treat it help a current trafficking victim, even though that would be complicated based on my experience and knowing how some of that works. Uh, but even even prisoners and ex-cons, um, people that struggle with mental health issues, people that struggle with maintaining a regular job, people that have past that would prevent them from getting a good job. That's who I'm passionate about serving. And and, you know, a lot of times the people that teach media, they 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 outprice people that need it the most. In fact, they're really teaching people that really may not even need the media as much. Uh, but for some, media is a vehicle for making our dreams come true. Of course, I think that's for everyone. But the thing about media that's really cool is that now it's not dictated on your budget because media is available for everyone for free. You just have to know what to do. Now, there's obviously levels to it, and it's really hard to be mega successful without money to invest in marketing. That is true, but there are organic ways to get your message out as well. And uh, so I'm very passionate about teaching that. Media Company in a Box is an all-in-one media solution that helps you with monetization, helps you with distribution, helps you with education, uh, helps you with monetizing your intellectual property, and also gives you the ability to use your gifts and talents in a way that allows you to provide for yourself and your family. Um, obviously there's more to it than that, but that's what the free discovery calls for. So just send me an email, contact me and any of the, wherever you're watching from, you will be able to contact me. And, um, the easiest way of course is my websites. But if you do not have the money to hire me for any of my services, including my book, by the way, um, because my book has proven to help a few people, even though it's very triggering for some, uh, it's honest. And, uh, but if you don't have the money, I don't believe in giving away free things anymore. I used to, 
and people don't value free. But what I do, what I will do is work out something with you that is an, a value for value trade. So if you don't have the money, don't let that stop you because learning media can absolutely change your life. It's changed mine. I'm living the life of my dreams and I probably have. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I probably have a little bit more complicated past than a lot of people that are watching this right now. But that said, um, I didn't have the options that, you know, I don't, I didn't have the, I didn't have an education. Um, I didn't, you know, the passing the background check thing was a problem for a while. It's not now um, because I got in a lot of trouble. I was a hurt, a hurting, hurting kid that turned into a, a hurting kid in a grown man's body. And I dedicated my life to becoming the man that God created me to be. It's not that easy. Um, and it hasn't always been that fun, but it's been the most rewarding journey of my life. And I'm still on it, by the way. I am not perfect, but my heart to teach and my heart to serve is very much there. Um, that said, this world's mayor experience that I was speaking about, the reason why um, it's called the world's mayor experience is because we want to travel the world and serve. We want to serve in the communities that we travel in for two weeks, working with different organizations and individuals and helping them and giving them the media tools that they need to amplify their message. Now, at the end of this two weeks, where this is the world's mayor experience part, is that it, there's going to be a blowout event at the very end where we celebrate the local heroes in that area. So whether it's New York City or London or Sydney, Australia or Beijing or Moscow, or Barcelona, or Dallas, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Los Angeles, or San Diego, um, uh, gosh, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, you name it, um, Afghanistan, absolutely Afghanistan, Dubai, anywhere in the Middle East, anywhere, anywhere that we're needed, we want to go, and we want to serve in those communities, and teach, educate, and equip all things media, all things bringing the benefits that people need or the the yeah benefits that people need whether it's clothing food whether it's education whether it's all the above whatever it may be counseling therapy we want to bring those resources and at the end of this two weeks we're gonna have a blowout event part festival part tonight show but just better music uh, um part conference part community gathering event anyway there's a lot to it, but this would be broadcast globally. Um, also would give people in the, the in the virtual world the opportunity to join virtually through virtual reality and other immersive media technologies. So many different things, and I don't want to just go into every little detail of it. But the whole idea, again, is we have a global vision, but our heart is for community because that community raises the child. Community raises I mean, it raises us. Like I'm, I was born in Oklahoma. I call LA home because it is home for me for a very specific reason. But Oklahoma, like that is where I was raised. And that is all over my DNA. And the community of Oklahoma shaped me. It shaped me everywhere I went, everywhere in the world and everywhere in the country that I've lived. And it is important to me to help commute, like I live in an amazing community now and it's a, a high functioning community. Everyone seems to work together to collaborate. There is no judgment on your race, uh, your sexuality, your religion, none of that stuff. It's just people get in to fit in. And we want to bring a healing message of truth. Uh, we want to inspire people to live in their gifts and their purpose and their talents and you know, I mean, that is, it's like it's deep seated in my, my bones. It's like ingrained in my DNA that I want to give people this opportunity to live the life of their dreams. And I believe that media is the vehicle to do it. And that's why I'm passionate about teaching it, because frankly, without media, I would not be living my dream. So this is not just a podcast. It's not just a broadcast. It's not just a live stream. It's not just an interview. There is a goal and a mission here. So when you share, when you like, and you subscribe, you are doing your part to contribute to that mission. So please share, like, and subscribe and follow along our journey. We need your support. Um, I love 
interviewing inspiring people that are actually making real change not these well not these people that you see on tv pretending to be heroes that's not who we're after that's not we we want the people in the trenches people that are actually in there fighting the fight um and have the scars to prove it so anyway thank you for watching thank you for being here and without further ado we're going to get into plastic oceans first and then we are going to get into the WION news, uh, talking about the supply chain and uh, child labor that is involved in blood battery. So thank you for being here. Let's have some fun. I think this is going to be fun. It'll be fun. I will try to make this subject as fun as possible. Thank you for being here. A lot of plastics release chemicals that have estrogenic activity. Estrogenic activity, or EA, happens when a chemical like BPA or phthalate leaches from plastic and enters the body, where it mimics the hormone estrogen. 92.6% of Americans aged 6 and older have detectable levels of BPA in their bodies. The levels in children between 6 and 11 years of age are twice as high as those in older Americans. The majority of plastics increase the release of chemicals having estrogenic activity after they've been exposed, particularly sunlight. How do you not consume it? You can't go anywhere without seeing food wrapped in plastic. You can't go to a restaurant without, you know, takeout boxes being in plastic, sure. hot foods going into plastic. My answer there is, well, demand safer plastic. Are all of those chemicals not regulated? No, the FDA at present does not have any regulations for how many chemicals and what levels of chemicals having estrogenic activity can be released from plastics or from cosmetics or papers or silicones. So how is the general public protected from that kind of thing? Uh, they aren't. It's so very hard as a parent to feel like you can do the best thing, you know, that you can do the right sure. thing anymore. Every day, you know, we're contributing potentially to a, a, a dreadful health problem later on down the line. I want to thank Plastic Oceans uh, for that clip and I've pulled that from YouTube. I hope I'm giving the proper thank yous for that because I didn't get permission. I just took it. And uh, but I am giving you credit. So thank you for watching that. I want to go through some brief talking points just to, you know, kind of fill in everything that this clip talked about today. And um, and again, I just hope that you can listen with an open heart and an open mind because. I, I remember, like the first of all, the paper straws are awful, and they are, and they're probably, and, I, and from what I understand, they're coated in something that we don't necessarily want, and <laughs> but I don't know that for sure because I don't, I didn't test it in the lab. But that said, the paper straws suck. I'd almost rather drink out of a metal straw uh, than a plastic straw, but the paper straws are terrible. So the. Like, I don't know what all the answers are, but it's important that we're aware so that maybe, hopefully, that this, this content today inspires you. Because if you're that person that can come up with a proper solution, then that's what I want. And I think sometimes delivering these messages, it's not telling, again, not telling you what to believe or what to do. It's just, here's the information. And I hope for someone it inspires a vision of that will bring a solution because there's got to be a solution to this. And because it's absolutely ridiculous 
what plastic pollution is doing, not just to the planet, but to us as humans. So without further ado, let's get into this. So the impact on mothers, which is a, that's the first thing that sticks out to, to sticks in to my mind. That is a plastic problem outside of the external ugliness of it, polluting our oceans and beaches and just our cities and towns. The doctrine disruptors, chemicals in the plastics like BPA can act as an endocrine disruptor affecting hormonal balance, which is crucial for uh, during pregnancy. Fetal development, exposure to plastic pollutants can lead to development issues in fetuses, including lower IQ and behavioral problems. That, that actually reminds me of the metals that we consume too, but that's another subject. I'm gonna make a note of that. We'll talk about that another time. Breastfeeding. This one blew my mind when I first learned about it. Chemicals from the plastic can enter breast milk, posing risk to newborns. So you're thinking, well, how is that possible? Fish eat food <laughs> or they eat what they think is food and it's plastic. We eat fish. We consume microplastics. There you go. But that's the short version. Other health risks and impacts on humans. Chemicals and plastics can leach into food and water. Oh, I just said that. Leading to health issues like cancer, liver dysfunction, and reproductive problems. Microplastics. These tiny particles can enter the human body through food, water, and air causing unknown long-term health effects. Here's another one, mental health. The sight of polluted environments can lead to psychological stress and anxiety. Now that's one of those things that's really easy to dismiss and make fun of and just say, oh, well, that's goofy. You know what? It makes me sad. It makes me sad to see a beautiful beach polluted with condoms and needles and I... One of the coolest beaches in San Diego is Ocean Beach. Ocean Beach in San Diego. There's a sick sports bar, and it's sick to me because, and sick in a good way, because that's where they they play the Oklahoma Sooners games. So when I lived in San Diego, that's where I went. No, that was an Ocean's Beach. What is the other? No, I mixed that up. My bad. That's not. That's Pacific Beach. Ocean's Beach has a bunch of really cool hangout spots, and there's a place that we used to go and play games, uh, play the giant Jenga drinking game. I don't drink anymore, but that game was stinking fun. But there's just a cool area in Ocean's Beach, a uh, really cool area too where there's just like, you know, Greenland area where people are just hanging out. And it's just a fun hippie beach that is polluted and it's disgusting. And I would never touch that sand ever, ever. Cool beach, dangerous, wouldn't go on it. Okay. So yeah, it affects my mental health and it, it should because this is nature. And I believe that our creator gave us this beautiful landscape, nature, because, well, I mean, we get to enjoy it and it produces our food and it provides oxygen. And, and again, I'm not a freaking expert on any of that stuff, but I do know that I love nature and I love to look at God's creation and it's just perfection that's not been screwed up by man. Like man has screwed up so much amazing stuff that God created. And, and it's gone. Like, I, I swear to you, the more I learn about life, the more I learn that everything that I truly value is free. And one of those free things that I value is getting to look out this window right here, that this is gorgeous park and there's parks all over my community. But I mean, it is beautiful here and the river that's right that runs through this town like it is it's beautiful and I think about all the lakes here and you know what for the most part the people of Minnesota take care of their stuff and it is really awesome that we take care of nature here and yeah there's taxes are high and all that other stuff but people take care of it but then I go to places like Los Angeles and I LA is home in my heart of course Northville is becoming home too but LA is home in my heart. It's where I died. It's where I found life. I love Los Angeles. People don't take care of Los Angeles. Like as a whole it is a cesspool now. 
And it's just, it's sad. It's sad to me because it's so, it's a magical place. And it's just been crapped on by broken dreams and drugs and excess. And I'm going to start preaching, so I'm going to stop. Okay. The environment, environmental impact of plastic pollution. Millions of marine animals die each year due to plastic pollution, either by ingestion or entanglement. You ever seen those little sea turtles? You get the beer can, you know, those little um, plastic rings that hold the cans. I, I remember seeing sea turtle trapped in one of those. And I, you know, I like sea turtles and that was sad to me. And I think about the oil spills, which that's a whole other conversation. Um, so I won't go there. But we are affecting like that's uh, we don't eat. I hope we don't eat turtles. But I mean, even the fish. They, they're 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 eating this stuff, and I mean, fish is amazing. I mean, we make sushi and fish. You know, it, fish provides meals for people that are poor because they can go fishing and get their own fish. But then, if they do that, and there's plastics and pollution in the fish, and then they consume that, then they're poisoning themselves. You're like, well, you should get a job and buy food. Well, that's not an option for everyone. And I don't know what the solution is. I'm just saying, like, maybe we could pick up a freaking trash. Let's start there. Maybe by reusing our plastic, maybe not using plastic at all. And I know how difficult that would be. But we can do little things like reusing plastic bottles. That's one thing of many we could do. I'm not. And here's the thing. And I, I should probably do uh, something about recycling because I don't think that that's really on the up and up the way that we think it is. Cause I think we ship that off to some Island somewhere and just dump trash. And like, we pay some third world country to dispose of that trash, but that trash never really gets disposed because the people that say that they're going to help dispose or pay for it. Don't like, it's a really screwed up, Like, man, we just don't have people that the, like our leaders as a whole, are failing us because what they do, I, I'm going to start preaching. Dad gummit, what they 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 have these agendas that they market and spend billions of dollars promoting, and it gives everyone this feeling that something's being done. But do you remember as a kid when your mom or your dad said you need to dust or you need to mop or you need to sweep or you need to vacuum, right? And then you're sweeping and you got all this dirt and you're like, oh, crap, I can't find the, the scooper to put the dirt in. Can't do it. So what do you do? You lift up the rug, sweep it in there. I used to throw away trash because I couldn't I didn't I was too lazy to go to the trash can for some reason as a kid. And I would put my wrappers in the vents. Part of a sucker or an apple or whatever. It wouldn't be a donut because I ate all the donuts. But that's another story. Ecosystem imbalance. Plastic waste can disrupt natural habitats, leading to imbalances in local ecosystems. E ecosystems, even our human ecosystems, it, it doesn't take much to pollute them. It put somebody in that's like not like-minded, put somebody in that's at a different energy level, frequency, if you want to go that direction. You know, people that, again, it, it can mess it up. Ecosystems are not meant to have anything unnatural in them. And, you know, this plastic is not exactly natural. Okay, non-biodegradable. Plastic take, plastics take hundreds of years to decompose, leading to long-lasting environmental damage. Okay, so back to this bottle again that I've used, I forget, 20 times maybe. And see, I, I'd do the math in front of you, but I would probably get embarrassed. Um, but I mean, it's still really good. It can be reused. There's no reason not to reuse it, right? I can put water in it. I, I mean, there's so many other things you can do, but this is not decomposing. So why wouldn't we reuse them? Solutions and responsibility. Well, I brought this up earlier. Recycling and upcycling. 
Encourage the practice of recycling practice and upcycling them into new products to reduce waste. Now, not all recycling stuff is, or recycling programs are BS, but it's not a perfect system. However, I am very inspired by plastic that has been upcycled. In other words, they produce new products. That's inspiring. That's showing good use. Now, is there probably more to that story? Yeah, unfortunately. There's probably a dark side to that too. It's just dead. It's just, it's unfortunate. And that can inspire a hopeless feeling. But it doesn't have to be. Because if we keep pushing just to do our part, not spend millions of dollars to promote an agenda, just us ourselves, take it upon ourselves to do the little things. It adds up. It adds up quickly. Again, if I think about this, this bottle, and I have other, actually, it's kind of embarrassing. So instead of buying water bottles all the time at my gym, I've got one of those, you know, they have that fancy water machine. So I take my bottles in. I probably look like I'm homeless um, when I do this. It doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do in, in reusing the bottles until I can't use them anymore. I fill up all my water bottles in that. And if I'm going to do a hydration packet or something like that, um, you know, I just can pour it in and reuse it. And that's how I get my flavor, put my pre-workout in, whatever it may be. But I mean, those are little things. And if we all do the little things, guess what? It adds up to something really big, really big. Okay. I don't necessarily agree with this, uh, but government regulations advocate for stricter laws on plastic production and waste management. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know if I trust the government to come up with a good solution, but you know what I do trust? Some millennial. I trust a millennial that is just going to come up with something so disruptive and outside of the box. Maybe they'll work with AI and AI is going to say, hey, why don't you try this? And then it's going to, I don't know. But it, I almost have more faith in someone in some college in some town coming up with something or not even outside of college, for that matter, or some guy that's a gamer coming up with something. I, I just I don't know if I trust the government to bring the solution because I kind of think they're part of the problem, even though they're the ones spending millions of dollars on these programs to promote these agendas. I I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know if I trust it. But I do hope that somebody out there gets inspired to bring a solution. And I do believe that there is a someone created a plastic eating bacteria. And I, I need to find information on that. But that's helping clean up some of the plastic pollution, which is exciting. Um, I heard about it about six months ago and never heard anything about it again. But I want to I want to look into that. OK. Consumer choices. Promote the use of eco-friendly alternatives like bioplastics and reusable items. I believe in that. One of the favorite things I like about Aldi, for instance, uh, of course, this can be a problem too, but you know, Aldi doesn't use plastic. You get the boxes that the products came in, and that's what people use. Now, of course, you can reuse those too, or you can break them down and recycle them. Like Aldi, to me, uh, is setting an amazing example. I also am one of those people, you can call me crazy, but I don't mind at all paying for plastic bags. Do you know why? Because the ones you pay for can be reused a bunch. You can even wrap gifts in it. Anyway, so I hope that was enlightening to you. I hope it was relatively interesting. I hope it inspired you to want to take a deeper dive. As I said, I am not an expert. I'm just a global citizen that sees this and I don't like it. I want something to be done about it. And I think we can do better. And at the same time, I'm looking at all these health issues that we have in the world, all of them. And I have to wonder how much is plastic poisoning from plastic pollution, how much is that playing a role? And I don't know the answer, but it's something to consider. 
So I hope and pray that this encourages you to do your part. Thank you for watching. And our next segment, <laughs> there's not going to be much of a breather here, but we are going to show you a couple of clips from WION News that are quite interesting. And we're going to have a deeper dive into blood batteries. We'll be right back after this. Congo's families want to ride this wave and tide over poverty. Sending their children to the mines is not a choice for them, but necessity. These children end up working as artisanal miners or informal workers. They're not employed by any company, but several companies line up to buy their fines. You see, it is cheaper to buy cobalt from a child than a regulated mine. And who understands business better than China? Most of these companies dealing in blood batteries are from China. It dominates the global supply chain of cobalt. China owns up to 50% of the metals production. It controls around 80% of cobalt's refining. In the last 15 years, Chinese companies have bought out North American and European companies mining in Congo. Today, Chinese firms own 15 out of the 19 industrial mines in this country. In exchange for Congo's cobalt, China has promised the country billions in investment in the form of infrastructure, schools and roads. Now, Congo is another example of how stories featuring China never end well. Today, China is leaking blood cobalt into the supply chain of electric vehicles. Chinese companies are buying cobalt from children, encouraging them to participate in the trade of blood batteries. One of the largest cobalt processors in Congo is a company called CDM, or Congo Dongfang Mining. It is a subsidiary of Zhejiang Huayu Cobalt, a Chinese company, of course. Huayu supplies cobalt to electric car makers like Volkswagen. 40% of Huayu's cobalt comes from Congo. Okay, so another form of slavery. And uh, that's really all there is to it. And of course, not all forms of slavery are the same. There's all kinds of slavery. And I'm sure that you know that by now. Um, I think I mentioned brick kiln slavery earlier. Um, of course, there's organ harvesting. There's human trafficking. There's I, there's That could be labor trafficking. Uh, it could be sex trafficking. Uh, there's so many. But one of the things that's often not talked about is that some of the child slaves that are forced to work, they're doing it. The parents are the ones that are putting them in this mix. Now, I forgot the, is it Cambodia? Cambodia, and not to cross the, the messages here, but in Cambodia, it's really common for the family. Like if you have a girl, it's it's considered to be a golden ticket. And what I mean by that is that if you have a girl, that means you can send her off to be a prostitute. Same in Thailand um, and other parts of the world. I mean, again, the sex trade is different everywhere you go. But a lot of times families feel that they have no choice but to sell their children. So here in the Congo, uh, where this is happening with the blood batteries, these children are forced to go work. And it's heartbreaking. Like, there's just, like, what else do you say about it? And I don't have a solution. I mean, don't buy an electric vehicle. I mean, is that the solution? I don't know. I don't know. But there's so much more. There's a deeper dive into this. And I have another clip to play uh, to close, close this out. And I'm going to include the full episode. And then again, there is so much information about this. Like this is not a secret. It's just not talked about that much. But I'm gonna play another clip after this. I'm gonna go through a few of the talking points that I have prepared. Um, and I hope at, at, at least that you can pray, you know, for a solution or something. But I wanna be part of the solution on this. I wanna end slavery, period. And frankly, we're all slaves in our own way. It could be a slave to addiction. It could be slave to debt. There's all kinds of ways that we're enslaved. We could be a slave 
in our own home because we are held captive by an abuser. Like those things happen. So I want to eliminate slavery everywhere, everywhere. And it's not exactly easy, but that's my heart's desire. And I especially want to be able to work. When I shared my vision at the opening of this broadcast, it when I, when I talk about the kids I want to help, I want to help. Because, see, I believe those kids there that are, that are slaves that are doing this work, digging for cobalt, they have gifts, they have talents, and it's not being used. And I promise you, if they were given the opportunity to use their gifts and their talents to make a life for themselves, they would do that over being a slave any day, all day. How many of us would? If you're not raising your hand right now, maybe you're already living your dreams and God bless you. I don't know. Or you're, never mind. There's a better way. This is, this is not it. So we get into this. So what are blood batteries? Blood batteries refer to batteries made using minerals like cobalt, which are sourced from conflict zones. These minerals are essential for making lithium ion batteries found in smartphones, laptops, and electric cars. These are, these are the ethical concerns. Child labor. In countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, children as young as seven are involved in the dangerous task of mining cobalt. They work in hazardous conditions, often without safety equipment. This one. War financing. The revenue generated from the sale of these minerals often go into financing armed groups and perpetrating conflict in these regions. In the same way, the drug trade funds wars, same difference. You really want to be pro-war? We got the wrong enemy. We are looking at the wrong enemy. <laughs> we, the people, the citizens of this world are not the enemy. It's the people in charge. Because this is what's happening. This happens. I'm going to stay on topic and not lose my mind. There's technological alternatives. Green batteries. Researchers, researchers are working on developing alternatives like solid state batteries, which are not only more efficient, but also don't require conflict minerals. Recycling. Recycling programs can help reduce the demand for new minerals. Only 5% of lithium ion batteries are currently recycled in a closed loop. Wow. Consumer choices. Consumers can opt for products that use ethically sourced materials. Some companies provide information on the origin of the minerals used in their products. Now, those are some solutions. These are, these are alternatives that have been brought. How much funding are we going to have for these things? Are we going to see our governments, our congresses, our parliaments, are we going to see them push money to these agendas? Or is it going to be all Green New Deal, Paris Climate Act, all that crap? That's leading to, never mind. I'm going to stay on topic. Consumer, I already said that. Okay, so here's some regulatory uh, measures that could be done too. Transparency. Companies should be required to disclose their supply chain practices, allowing consumers to make informed decisions. The government's role. 
Governments can impose sanctions and regulations to ensure that companies are sourcing minerals ethically. Certifications. Initiatives like the Fair Trade Certification for Minerals can help consumers easily identify ethically sourced products. I love that. I love that. You know, and the, the problem, okay, so here's here's a potential problem to that. It, I mean, fair trade is actually pretty legitimate from what I understand, but you know, those of you who know about organic labeling, organic doesn't always mean it's not 100% organic. Like it doesn't always mean that. It has to be 93%. So, you know, labels can be deceiving and there's always a little fudge room when it comes to certifications. It just is. I, in every certification I've ever been, been involved with, whether it's an FDA uh, approval or authorization, uh, whether whether it's a certification for you know a, a, a course, there, there's always a little bit of fudgery that is allowed. Always, I've never seen it not, never. So I don't know if fair trade is 100% on the up and up, but it's pretty damn gum close from what I can tell. Here's some social responsibility. Corporate accountability. <laughs> I mean, look, if all the corporations in, in the world, the main corporations can sign a corporate accountability declaration with the Pope from the Vatican, it's in the Vatican paper, you can Google it. It's there. It happened right before uh, COVID happened in 2020. Very easy to find on the internet. It's still there because I just did a talk about it. It's worth looking at. Um, so, I mean, I know corporations can get together and, you know, come together in agreement on a plan. I know they can because it's happening right now. And that's another conversation. Companies have a moral obligation to ensure their supply chains are ethical. Corporate social responsibility initiatives can play a role in this. They should. They should. They should. They should. They should. They should. Guess what? We have to be the ones to hold them accountable because they're not going to volunteer to do it. If it hurts their pocketbook and it affects their tax, uh, not tax, it affects their stock value or the value of their company, they're not going to do it. But let me give you, let me give you something that may change your mind a little bit. So when I worked in healthcare, my very last job before I started down this path that I'm on now was negotiating contracts with insurance companies. You know, so for disabled people um, that they, they could get access to their medical equipment like there's, you know, insurance companies are always trying to cut the budgets, uh, make it hard. I don't know if you've ever, you know, had to buy medical equipment before and had a really large copay um, or it was outside of the allowable that you were given because, you know, everything has a code like uh, a basic power wheelchair at that time was a K-11 is what we called it, which was K-0011 but we called it K-11 and it had a um, that $5,845 was the scheduled amount that it was allowed. So that means anything you could buy the wheelchair, like you were going to get paid $5,845 if Medicare and the secondary insurance paid for it. So if you don't have the secondary insurance that you though, there's a 20% remainder, but typically you, there was enough money, at the beginning, there was enough money in there where you could write that off. Well, then Medicare started changing that and then started cutting the allowables. So it was killing profits and so forth. Um, what was I going with this point? Oh my God. I over explained myself and forgot where I was going to go with that. Um, the, the, the allowables, uh, government responsibility, that sucks. I can't believe I just brain farted that bad. Oh, that's embarrassing. There really was a point to me telling you about this. Allowables, anyway. So wait, corporate, nope, that's not it. Public awareness, okay. Let me just keep talking and then maybe it'll come to me. The more people know about the issue, the more pressure there will be on companies to change. Social media campaigns, documentaries, and public talks can help spread awareness. Um, I really wish I could remember what I was saying. But yeah, it's important. Like, listen, we know that this is a problem. We can organically speak about it if we care about it. 
we talk, we we find ourselves in these arguments about election fraud or COVID or, you know, to be vaccinated or not. And we, we, we fight about who the best quarterback is, who the worst quarterback is. My baseball player is this, or I mean, what we, we, what was on TV last night, but issues that in fact, actually, and the other thing too, is that a lot of times what you see on social media are people parroting, parroting, the talking points that they saw on the news. So that's what they're sharing. But really have no standing to be able to speak to the subject because they're just recycling what's been told to them. But when you see the information for yourself and you see that, oh, that these are this is factual information. Okay, whoa, holy crap, this is affecting my life. Should I do something about it or not? That's up to you to decide. But what would feel better? To take a stand for something that you believe in, something that you know for a fact is affecting you, affecting your children, affecting your future, affecting your well-being, but you knew for sure, because you knew for sure, because you saw the evidence yourself. Or... What you see on the meet and through the media, which is an opinion basically, disguised as fact. Somehow that happened. I don't know how that happened. But when you see factual evidence of something, wouldn't it be better to draw attention to that? The, the thing that you can prove that the thing that if you were to have someone come and argue with you or to try to say, hey, you know, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> and, and, and the way that they try to say that you're wrong for your opinion is by giving a talking point that they saw through the media. You know how easy it is to one, identify those people that only watch the news and then the people that, and, and then you, you can identify them pretty quickly, but then you can also shut them down in a hurry. Why? How? Well, because they can't go past the talking point. There's no true evidence to anything. None. Because a pie graph is not evidence. But when you're being presented information, boom, 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 that you can verify on your own, independently, what are you going to do about it? Listen, I'm an activist. I don't want to tell anyone to go out and boycott anything. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not that guy. But instead of supporting these organizations that are contributing to the problem, how about contributing to the people that are bringing a solution? Because you don't have to say, I'm boycotting a blank company. You don't have to do that. You don't have to say, I'm never using plastic again. You don't have to say it. You, you could. Could. You better hope that you're serious because the next time you're drinking plastic, after you're talking about plastic pollution and how bad it is, you better be prepared not to use plastic again. Or you could just reuse the plastic. I don't know. But, and then also, like, money that you support there's nonprofits that are helping with plastic pollution. There's nonprofits that are helping fight blood batteries. I think bloodbatteries.com is a website or bloodbatteries.org is an organization that is fighting against blood batteries. It's org.com. Check them out. Um, so yeah, these are the these are very an overview. Not a lot of detail because we'd be here for five hours. And I believe that sometimes the message can get lost in the detail, which I know detail is important, but detail is important for the people that want it. So if you want more information, I've got a whole bunch of it, and I'm happy to send it to you. Um, and if you're somebody that's an expert in this, or if you even have a disagreement about anything I just said, say it, speak it, come on and come on the show. Let's talk about this. 
Because I don't want to just say this is all bad, even though slavery is bad. Even when it's the only option some people have. I would rather bring solutions to the table. Because solutions give people an opportunity to meet at the middle. Solutions tend to not hurt other people. Solutions can bring people together. And ultimately, that's what I'm here to do. Now, I don't believe that there's healing that can be done without truth. I don't believe that, you know, you can go through life being naive. Um, I mean, I guess you could do that, but I don't believe that that helps anything. It's good to be informed, but what are you being informed about? And, uh, but it's no good to complain. In fact, it's no, I don't even know if protest even works. A protest in the form of going out and destroying people's property and screaming at other people and calling people idiots on social media and that kind of stuff. I don't believe that that's really going to help anything because I know that when I'm called an idiot, I know what I want to do. And it's typically not give that person a hug or smile and say, Jesus loves you. I think that's just not what I want to say. I may say that. I may say, bless your heart. But if you know what bless your heart really means, then <laughs> it's not so nice. <laughs> you stupid idiot. Anyway, no, I don't want to. I'm just kidding. Anyway, this subject sucks. It does. But, you know, maybe together we can bring a solution. So I've got one more clip here. And this gets into the child labor aspect. So now that you have that meat in the middle there, now's the... Now's the end. And hopefully, when you watch it and see it through a different lens than you saw the first time, nonetheless, thank you for watching. Um, I'm not coming back after this clip, but I will see you on episode four. Thank you for your support. Thank you for liking, subscribing, and sharing with friends wherever you're watching or listening from. My name is Joshua T. Berglund, and this I'm is the world. In 2016, the Chinese company was called out by an NGO. It was branded a benefactor of child labor. Huayu pledged to clean up its act. But did anything change on the ground? Reports raise serious doubts. This is one part of the story. There is blood in China's large-scale mines too. There, workers are abused, discriminated, beaten, and made to work without contracts and sufficient ration. One worker told the media, and I'm quoting, if a worker dies, the Chinese don't report it to the government. They bury the person hiding the corpse and bribe the family to keep quiet. That's your electric car killing people even before it hits the road. Did you sign up for this? The world's biggest car makers are complicit in these crimes. I'm talking about the likes of Tesla, Volvo, Renault, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, they all source cobalt from Chinese mines in Congo. Sure, they claim to have a zero-tolerance policy when it comes to child labor, but they too know that there is no way to fully map their supply chains. Back in Congo, President Felix Shishikedi has pledged to act. In 2019, he established a state-run company to focus on health and human rights. But that hardly helps when Congolese officials are accused of overseeing child labor. In 2020, Tesla announced it would start using cobalt-free lithium-ion batteries in its electric vehicles, but the company followed up the announcement with a deal with Glencore. It's a cobalt mining company, and this deal was for 6,000 tons of cobalt a year. 6,000 tons a year. Doesn't add up, does it? Much like the claim of electric cars being clean, these cars run on dirty energy, on blood batteries. And this is not climate solution. This is human rights abuse. And the two cannot coexist. Climate solution is not supposed to be at the expense of human lives. Long story short, electric vehicles have miles to go before they can claim to be clean. <laughs>